welcome back to a journey through John as we spend four sessions exploring some of the distinct and unique themes in the Gospel of John and thinking particularly about the significance of these for our journey with God. In the last session, we introduced John's Gospel, thinking about how it's different to the other three Gospels, focusing especially on its purpose, which as John 20 verse 31 tells us, is that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. And it's this theme of belief and its connection to life that is the first of our three themes that we'll be exploring. And it plays a really important role throughout the narrative. In this session, we'll begin to unpack this theme more, especially for its significance for our journey as followers of Jesus. We'll be turning to John 11 as we consider how belief in Jesus both begins and sustains our life in him. But to begin with, I would love for you to pause in your groups to take a moment to discuss um, from the last session, what stood out to you? Can you remember and recap some of the differences between John's Gospel and the others? And did anything about this surprise you? You might want to take a few minutes to do that and then we'll come back. Hopefully you enjoyed that discussion together and it brought back lots of memories from our last session. Now John's Gospel is a carefully structured story and last time we said that it could be understood best as theology in narrative form. And it has a crafted plot that focuses on the identity of Jesus being progressively revealed throughout. We said also last time that John's Gospel is more focused on who Jesus is rather than just what he did. And there's a further distinct feature of John's Gospel that emphasises this and is strongly connected to this theme of belief that we're exploring in this session. And it's something that's become known as the seven I am sayings and the seven signs, which all point to and seek to further reveal Jesus's identity. There are seven occasions within the Gospel of John where Jesus climactically says, I am, followed by a really loaded statement. He reveals what we are to believe in him being. So one of the I am sayings is found in John 11 verse 25, which we'll touch on, where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Now, there are a number of significant things about these seven disclosures. This phrase, I am, or in the Greek, ego me, is used on the lips of Jesus 26 times and is a really significant phrase for the gospel with heavy theological meaning. It is the Greek translation of the name of God that's revealed to Moses in Exodus 3. It's this divine self-declaration, which is one of the most significant revelations of God's identity in the Old Testament. As you'll know, in Exodus, Moses has fled Egypt, where his people, the Israelites, are in slavery. And after about 40 years, he sees a burning bush and he goes up to it. And suddenly God speaks to him, saying, Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen their suffering and I want to deliver them and I'm going to send you. Moses is like, what? And there's a bit of chat to and fro, but then basically Moses is like, okay, if I'm going to go, who do I say has sent me? Like, what's your name? And then we read in Exodus 3 verse 14, God says to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you would say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Interesting name, very loaded, and we could spend a lot of time on that. But this is the phrase that is being used in John's gospel when Jesus says, I am. He is identifying himself as divine, and it is an expression of his authority. Now, you guessed it, it's competition time. That's right, I don't forget, the competition carries on. And I would love you to take a minute and pause and See if you can have a go at naming all of the seven I am sayings in John's Gospel. I've given you one a little earlier on, but there are six more. Now, you might want to do this together as a group, as it's quite a challenging question. Or if you're in my husband's group, I'm so sorry. I have a feeling he'll want to go head to head. But why don't we pause the video and have a go and we'll come back for the answers. Amazing, I hope you got on okay. I'm aware that is a very, very hard question, but I'm gonna give you the answers now so you can be ready. Pens are ready, points are coming your way. 
and I'm going to whiz through them. So Jesus says that I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door of the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth and the life, and I am the true vine. So there's seven points. If you got any of those, you get a point. And don't forget to add that to what you got from the last session, which was out of 15. We're counting, we're gonna keep this going. There could be a prize, depending on the group leader. Now, each of these seven I am sayings speaks of Jesus's divine identity as God and are ways of describing the life and the salvation Jesus offers to those who believe. See, John's gospel seeks to persuade us that Jesus wasn't just this historical figure, but that he was God incarnate and that he came to offer us life in all its fullness. What is implicit often in the other gospels is made explicit in John's gospel. So there are the seven I am sayings, but there are also something that's been called seven signs, which Jesus performs. Now, John's gospel doesn't have as many of the miracles that the other three synoptic gospels do, but rather seems to pick just a few of the perhaps more dramatic and impressive miracles that then bear some symbolic and deeper meaning. This selectivity means that John is able to devote more time to narrating the miracle and reflecting on its meaning and its theological significance, especially in relation to Jesus's identity. I'm going to be kind to you this time and I'm going to give you the seven signs and in fact you can all have seven points at this moment. So the seven signs in the Gospel of John that point to Jesus' identity and that John uses in a more loaded way are Jesus turning water into wine, feeding the 5,000, healing an official son, healing the paralytic, walking on water, healing the blind man and the raising of Lazarus. Now, all of these signs, in the same way like signs on a street point to something and tell you what it is, are intended to signify who Jesus is and inspire belief in him. These signs, like the I am signs, are pregnant with symbolic and theological meaning. They're loaded and there's so much we can draw from them. It's in these moments we can see most clearly that the life Jesus came to bring breaks into our everyday struggles and sufferings. We realize that the life Jesus brings is stronger and more powerful than sickness, than disease, than poverty and lack. The greatest challenge and struggles those around him were facing. It is in these miracles we see the power of Jesus coming head to head with the struggles we face in this world. And that this life that Jesus offers is possible for those who believe. Now it's thought that these seven signs culminate in John's narrative in what is sometimes described as the eighth sign and the final most glorious sign, which is Jesus's own death on a cross and his resurrection, which is the moment in which we see most clearly the identity of Jesus, that even death itself, the worst that the world can throw of us, can't frustrate or contain the life Jesus came to bring. Jesus is able to overcome even death itself. We're going to turn now in our groups to go a little bit deeper in the seventh sign found in John 11, the raising of Jesus's friend, Lazarus. Because it's here where I really think we find the key themes of belief in Jesus and the life he offers come to the fore. As we've said, this gospel isn't just interested in if you believe in Jesus as a person who once lived one time, but rather whether you believe who Jesus is. Do you believe him to be the bread of life, the light of the world, the son of God? This is the question the gospel is constantly asking us and confronting us with, and not least in this passage. As the penultimate sign, it foreshadows Jesus' own death and resurrection. And we see the theological connection between Jesus' death and the life it means for those of us who believe. In the verses before that you're going to read, Jesus knows that going to Bethany, Judea, and raising Lazarus from the dead is going to provoke the events which lead to his own death. But he still does this out of love. And it's a foreshadowing of how he is prepared to lay his own life down out of love at the cross for us to have life. I'd love you to take a moment now to pause in your groups for someone to read John 11 verses 11 to 48. And as you're reading this, I would love for you to look out for these themes of belief and life that appear and to see how they're connected. 
then you might want to take a moment to discuss anything that stands out to you about this beautiful and powerful passage, and then we'll come back. Hopefully you had a good discussion in your groups and maybe you were able to start to see how this theme of belief is woven throughout the narrative. Again and again, Jesus says, do you believe? Do you believe in my ability to bring life and to transform your situation? At the heart of this story, you may have noticed in verse 25 to 26 was the I am saying where Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. But it's followed by this climactic question, this question the whole gospel has been asking and now Jesus asks us, do you believe this? And this is then followed by a climactic confession of Martha who becomes for us a model of what it means to be a disciple. As she replies in verse 27, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. If we remember back to the purpose of this gospel, we'll find it is so we will say that, so we will believe he is the Messiah, the Son of God. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus, to say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you and the life you offer. The gospel of John seeks to lead us from just belief in the actions of the things Jesus did to believe in who Jesus is. C.S. Lewis quite famously once said, I am here trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him, Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who claims he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or else something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come up with any patronising nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And to that I would add, neither has John's gospel. The question of this gospel, the question Jesus asks us is, will we believe? Reflecting back on this story in John 11 to finish, we find that Lazarus had been dead four days. That's basically code for, he is dead, dead. Now, this is one of the few times where I really love the King James Version. Verse 39, it says, by this time, he stinketh. It is in this setting that stinks of death and hopelessness. This is the setting in which God reveals his glory, his loving and life-giving nature. The worst the world can offer can't restrain or contain the extent of the power of the life made possible through Jesus. And yet it's here we see not only the power of Jesus as God, but also the depths of his humanity, of Jesus as a human. In verse 35, the shortest verse in the whole of scripture, it says Jesus wept. Jesus feels the void created in life by death. He weeps in front of it. He has compassion for the pain and suffering for those who grieve, even though he knows life is about to come. And this passage is really powerful because it's a moment where Jesus is practicing what he has been preaching. He powerfully demonstrates his identity as the giver of life. And there's a further final key to this theme of belief that I want us to finish with. In John 5, verse 24 to 29, Jesus says this, Very truly I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, a time, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. If we think about what happened to Lazarus, he heard the voice of God and he lived. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself 
and he has given him authority to judge because he is the son of man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Here we get this sense of this promise that what has happened for Lazarus will happen for us. And we see there's this connection between hearing the words of Jesus and believing. We find that John 11 is John 5 in action. Lazarus heard the voice of God and came to life. And what happened for Lazarus will happen for us. Echoed in this story in John 11 and confirmed by John 5 is this sense of the creation story of Genesis 1. The word of God that speaks life into being, new creation. It's the same word of God bringing life to Lazarus, creating new life in the formless and emptiness of death. What Jesus does for Lazarus, he will do for you. Because we are all Lazarus. We are all caught up in a world full of the stench of death, surrounded and bombarded by things in our circumstances, our culture, the society, the voices we hear that only contribute to a spiritual death, that attack our soul. But it's the voice of Jesus, the life of Jesus, ignited by hearing and believing that enables us to become fully alive in him and to live life in all its fullness as he promised. Jesus says to us, to our world, come out, come live. This experience of resurrection life takes place every time somebody responds to Jesus calling them by name. This is a picture of what it means to become a disciple and of daily being a follower of Jesus. Each day, Jesus is calling us, come out, come live, come live the life I have died for you to know. I love Jesus' instructions in John 11 to the living. In verse 44, he says to those who are around Lazarus, take off the grave clothes. The new life Jesus calls into being in us, in the world, sometimes needs unwrapping. We need each other to help. Someone comes to faith, but they're caught in patterns of addiction, caught in a system of poverty, caught up in old habits and grave clothes of the old creation. Will we as disciples go to the places in our community where the stench of death is bad? Will we roll away the stones, the cultural, historical, practical blockages that are preventing people from hearing about Jesus, from coming into the Christian community and from walking into church? Will we as followers of Jesus gather around those who find new life in Christ to help remove the grave clothes, to help them out of old habits, past pain and to find freedom? Because John teaches us this is what it means to follow Jesus to hear his voice, to believe, to discover the life he has for us, and then to be part of unwrapping that life in the lives of others around us. This is the difference believing in Jesus makes. To finish, I wonder if you might wanna pray together in your groups. Maybe there's situations in your life and you resonate with Lazarus or the grief of Mary and Martha and you would love and need the power of God to break in. Maybe you are in a season of grief and you would love to know the presence of God. Maybe you've never really felt God speak to you and this idea of hearing God's voice feels new and you would love to hear God's guidance and wisdom in your life. Or maybe you feel stirred to help others You're passionate about areas of injustice, about seeing people discover the love of God and you want to be part of what Jesus is doing. Perhaps take a moment in your group to share what has resonated with you from this passage and what you would love prayer for.